Okay, so I have to record this because I got to do research um, on what I'm calling the prime radiant. Have you heard of the periodic table? Uh, yes, I know exactly what it is. You just ate some of the periodic table. I know. You ate some water and some sucrose, which is probably there's some hydrogen involved. Yeah. All sorts of fun stuff. So, what is the periodic table from what you understand? It's like this, this, uh, it's kind of like this big table of the little squares that are colored differently. And I think they're colored differently on how dangerous they are. Mm. And. Like your mom would be super red, and I'd be super green. Dad, <laughs> shut the bleep up. <laughs> That's right, this is family friendly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so they are colored a bit sometimes in some tables. And, um, yeah, they. Um, it, like, spells out their er credentials mm -hmm. of the element. Mm hmm. And then that gives chemists uh, and physicists and anybody that's interested in messing with physical nature, even people making popsicles, it gives them an idea of how things can interact. Yeah. Because it also kind of puts them in relationship to each other, like some are metals and some are non-metals. You might also realize that this popsicle stick is touching the wood, and it tastes differently when all of those chemicals are coming into the chemicals of the wood. That's right. So you got that, that periodic table affects your tongue, it affects the, the popsicle, it affects the popsicle stick. Yeah. Yeah. So it helps us to understand how the world works, and I want to do something like that for the science of morality, because you know, remember what happened when we... Oh no, don't eat the apple, Dad. Yep, that's morality for you. Remember what happened when we left the church? What? Me and Mom got all you kids together, and we apologized <laughs> for sending you to church all the time. Yeah. Uh, you might have been a bit young for that, because this was, gosh, you're 12... You might have only been two years old when this happened. Maybe, maybe three or four. Yeah, I never really liked being a Mormon. <laughs> I okay, never come really on, did God. You were a Mormon for like a year or two of your conscious life. Yeah, and I never liked it, and I never <laughs> believed in God. I'm like, well, let's see the knowledge. We have at hand. So whatever you didn't say any of that table, crap. Nothing happens. Obviously, <laughs> God didn't make this food. Grandma and Grandpa did. Okay, that is true. You did say that prayer, <laughs> and you were like <laughs> three years old. <laughs> dear dear uh, Grandma and Grandpa, oh, no, dear God, thank you for the food, even though we all know that Grandma and Grandpa made it. <laughs> Yeah, they were kind of cringing, and me and mom were like, <laughs> we couldn't, we couldn't uh, hardly hold in our laughter. Were you just not comprehending that that was me saying that I don't think God exists? Well, I guess we hadn't taken the conclusion quite that far, but um, so when we when we left, uh, we left some interesting structure because. <coughs> what mom and I had with Mormon is one of the one of the nice things that you didn't get as a God believer is we knew that God had our backs. We knew that He created everything and that He knew everything and that He had a plan and that we had a part in that plan. Sure, we might go to hell. He might send us there because He loves us, but still, it was a game we were willing to play. Yeah, and I've actually heard stories of people that, like, think God exists, and they, they, 
Apparently this one man actually, like, went up to a tiger or something, thinking that God would intervene. Well, uh, let's just say that that person isn't around anymore. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it gives us... Well, that's a perfect example, because religion sells people the idea of confidence. Yeah. It's just like government. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Probably a good analogy. So, so what I what I'm what I gave up I gave up God. Um, you didn't have to give it up because you never really got <laughs> in. Never had. You can't uh, give away something you never <laughs> That's wanted right. or had. That's right. So I I gave up that. Mom gave up that. But we also gave up that certainty in some ways. And Mom has kind of picked up some of that certainty. It seems like by um, is that better or was that worse? Is that good? Um, she picked up some of that certainty by jumping into social media. Like she, she loves to listen to her um, her English uh, Saturday not Saturday Night Live um, talk show people, uh, and she you know she laughs and listens to their analysis of how the world works and why, and she's always plugged into the news, and so she kind of filled that void because she had the certainty with the church and then you leave the church and you're like oh shit well if God's not in charge who's in charge how does the world work why aren't we murdering and stealing from each other constantly if we don't have to live the ten commandments blah 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 so we have to build up our own certainty again and mom's done that quite a bit through stories of, of news and social media and stuff like that um I wanted to to have that same level of certainty. <clears throat> and so I've kind of dived into the philosophy side of things. And I love the idea of the periodic table. I, I, I read this book called um, A Brief History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. I think you'd like that one. You'd, you'd like to listen to that because he was about your age and he was in school and he had a geography book and they had, they had a picture of the globe and they had sliced the globe like a pie out of it big wedgy section out of it so you could see clear into the core and I guess the slice went through like Nebraska or something and you just imagine cars driving off that cliff falling into the earth's core just <laughs> 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 what for what is this why is this a giant <laughs> how the atmosphere would work if there was a big pie slice out of the earth I don't know but uh, well, the atmosphere will probably uh, get thinner because, oh, as uh, that's a good good point. The atmosphere, while where the slice was, we get sucked into that hole. Stays huh? there, and the others there's kind of get. Tr- it's kind of like trying to separate a bit of Play-Doh from other or Play-Doh, like. As you try and pull away uh, some of it, it, like, kind of trails along and leaves a messy line that's very thin. I've heard of that. That's called Plato tectonics, huh? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I've never really heard of that. Oh, no, that's plate tectonics. Um, So... (laughs) So he saw that slice there, and he's like, how do scientists know that the earth looks like that like nobody's ever taken a chunk out of the planet to see what it looks like so he he wondered and from that time when he was a kid about your age and he just had all these questions about how scientists knew things once he got older and had his career going and he had some time and some money he decided to write a book about the subject so he went and interviewed all these scientists he's like how do we know how old the earth is how do we know all this stuff so as I was going through that one, um, I have a feeling that they kind of know how ooh, the Earth, that that's how the Earth looks by seismic stuff. Like you know how we can predict earthquakes with seismic machines. Mm-hmm. So I feel like we could be able to pin, like basically find out the structure of the Earth by looking at seismic stuff. And seismic works off of sound waves, doesn't it? Yeah. And I have a feeling that sound waves will get a little weird when you start to get really hot. That's interesting. Well, yeah, 
I guess, but then the sound would still travel through something that's hot, even like lava. Yeah. That's why they could probably hear an earthquake even through lava. But really bad. Oh, but it wouldn't be very clear. Like, like it's why listening to underwater telephone, like, uh, at like the... Like, womp, 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 Yeah, womp. the very last person says that all they heard was... <laughs> like, that you just can't hear anything. Unless you're Aquaman, and apparently he can talk just fine underwater. Yeah. Because <laughs> of science. No. <laughs> um, so when when he started talking about where the periodic table came from in his book, I was like, man, that's pretty badass. Because at the time, nobody really understood the relationships between the chemicals. They didn't even have a standard way of referring to the, to the different elements and things. And yeah. so he gave them uh, this periodic table, which formed a structure that they could all get behind. And it really launched the science of chemistry. So, I want to do the same thing for the science of morality. The problem is there really isn't a science of morality, because... Morality is just a view. What we see as right may not actually be right. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you put it that way. Um, morality is, in my mind, the same thing as ethics. People talk about ethics or right and wrong, or good and bad, and then they also refer that back to morality. It's like this big circle, this loop, but they really don't ever talk about what it is. So I've got a definition that I think works pretty good, which is kind of what you just referenced, but my the thing I wanted to research right now with you is uh, our goodometer, or our badometer. Like, <clears throat> you asked me what kind of popsicle would you like? And before that, it's like, oh, is a popsicle a good idea? You know, should we have a, a popsicle? Yeah. We both agreed, yes, number one, yes, a popsicle is a good idea. And number two, that orange was a good choice. Yeah. We had grape and orange to choose from, is that it? Well, we had a lot of other things, too. Oh, Pretty much a lot of flavors you can think of. Cherry. Oh boy. Uh, I don't know what the green one is. Uh, and then there's also, I think, blueberry. Uh-huh. Yeah, there's a few choices. Okay. So, you have what's called opportunity cost, which means if you choose to do one thing, sometimes you can't do another thing. Like, if we have, right now, if we're eating a cherry popsicle, we can't at the same time be eating an orange popsicle. Yeah. At least it'd be a little tricky. Yeah, we could, but <laughs> it would be a little tricky, yeah. And you can't wear, like, my glasses and your glasses, or typically you can't wear all of your underwear at the same time. <laughs> yeah, if you use all, all your underwear at the same time, your bottom would be very heavy, <laughs> and you also would look really weird. And with the glasses thing, your vision would get sorted because uh, you're not supposed to see through someone else's glasses. And yep. you're not supposed to look through your own glasses. And if you were to drive somewhere, you can't drive two places at once. Yeah, you'd have to cut your car in half, rewire er, er, it a bunch so that both halves work, work, and do a bunch of stuff with it. And you still can't be in both cars at Exactly. Once. So that's opportunity cost. Is sometimes the cost of doing one thing is that you you can't do all the other things that you might have been doing at the same time. Uh, that's actually... And a really good way to represent that is money. If you spend money on one thing, you might not have enough for another thing. I like it. Want. Like, you have, like, a few hundred dollars. You buy a Switch. But then you realize, well, I can't buy a computer anymore. And you wanted both, but you can't because you don't have enough money. Right, perfect analogy. So it's it's based on scarcity that, you know, if you do have enough money, you could buy several things at once. But if, if as that money gets more and more scarce, you run more and more into opportunity cost. Yeah. The, the opportunity cost goes up and up and up. So I wanted to... Um, I wanted to see if we could figure out how you and I determine what's better or what's worse. Like, would you say it's better to have more money or less money? Well, 
that depends on what you're trying to use it for. Okay. If you're trying to use, use it to buy a gun and, and, like, shoot someone, then that's not good because it makes someone else suffer. So you're saying it might be better in that case for you to not have the money to buy the gun in the first place. Yes, but at the same time, I mean, you could be trying to use that money to help the starving people. Okay, so purpose becomes part of our calculation, huh? Yes, purpose becomes reason. Okay, we reason about purpose, and then uh, how do you... So let's maybe let's, let's figure this out by... Okay, so you'd like to watch a lot of shows on YouTube, right? Yes. Um, do you ever get to the point where you're like, I don't want to watch any shows on YouTube because I've been watching for too long? Well, sometimes, yes. Like, for example... On Netflix, I'm like, I want to watch uh, Seven Deadly Sins. And then I decide uh, it's getting really repetitive and it's taking a long time for the episodes to come out. I'm just going to keep watching Pokemon for a bit, watch something else. Okay, so what makes you, what makes Seven Deadly Sins good at a certain time? You, you maybe have a new episode, like yeah. when you first are introduced to it. So newness is a factor. You already said purpose is a factor. Um, what else makes watching an episode of Seven Deadly Sins super good versus, eh, I think, I'll switch over to Pokemon? Well, uh, there's ideas. It could give you an idea for a project or for something. Okay. So you get paid... So as you participate in an activity, as you start to do something, it will pay you with ideas, or it'll pay you with entertainment of some sort. And that entertainment yeah. could be ideas, or it could be um, you enjoy the artwork. Or sometimes just a story. The story, the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what makes a lot of things good, like a good book or a good movie. Okay, so your goodometer relies on purpose, on newness, and then on um, h how well reward. you get reward, how, how well you get rewarded. All right. Purpose, newness, reward. Yeah. How, what's, what's that? PNR. <laughs> PNR. What's a better way of saying newness? Um, Novelty? Novel originality. Originality. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we like... So if you had the same thing, like what if you had... What if you could only eat popsicles for the rest of your life? Well, then you wouldn't... Well, first of all, you'd probably die. <laughs> you'd have a short life. <laughs> <laughs> your life is going to get shorter. Unless your popsicles were made out of uh, lasagna and... Cauliflower. <laughs> <laughs> no, and not everything that a popsicle is made out of. Oh, could you imagine a cauliflower popsicle? Oh, or fair. broccoli? Ugh. Oh. Or even a chicken popsicle? Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know about that either. Yeah, because that can also be dependent on, like, for example, your popsicle thing, like... Uh, foods can be uh, uh, tasted and processed in a certain way depending on their state. Are they frozen? Are they a little mm -hmm. cooked? Are they a little Because you, like, you don't like chicken that's been frozen so much. Yeah, I don't really like frozen chicken. You like a fresh rotisserie chicken. Yeah. So I have an idea about the um, novelty stuff. Because I remember when I was uh, your age, maybe Tide's age, I, I could never get as much ice cream as I wanted. Yeah, me neither. And I'm like, oh, it'd be great if I had money and I could just go buy my own ice cream. And, and eventually I got a paper route. I wasn't much older than you, so I'd go deliver newspapers to people. This was before the internet. And so you got your news through the newspaper <laughs> or the radio or sometimes the TV. But anyway, newspapers were a bigger deal when I was a kid. So I would get paid... I don't know, 20 bucks a week or something to go deliver newspapers all week. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough to that eventually I had 
20 bucks in my pocket. I'm like, she, I'm going to go buy a thing of ice cream. So I called up my friend, Eddie. I said, Eddie, meet me over at my house. We're going up into the attic. We're going to take two bowls, two spoons, and a big thing of ice cream, and we're going to go pig out. He's like, yeah. So he comes over. We climb up the ladder into the attic access. We get into the attic, and we have the, we have our bag with the stuff in it. We take it out. We dish up a couple of bowls of ice cream, and we're just having a party. And then we got a second bowl of ice cream. We're like, yeah, we get as much as we want. Nobody knows we're here. We don't have to share with anybody. And after the third bowl, we got off, or after the second, we got a third bowl. And then we're like, huh. <laughs> this is not as good as the first bowl. <laughs> but we ate it. Yeah. And then we're like, okay, there's just a little bit of ice cream left. Let's just eat the last. So we split it up and we ate the last. But it was, I remember it being fairly painful <laughs> to eat that last bit of ice cream. Yeah, and then that comes how you use something. Because, for example, a lot of people could tell you that you can have too much of a good thing. Like, ice cream mm, tastes really good, but when you eat it too much, your, your stomach starts hurts to feel not very good, and uh, it just doesn't taste as good, and you get really full from it. Okay, so you're saying quantity matters. Like, like you might... Okay, so, so now, you're, now you're getting on the, the real good stuff. So we have these desires, we have preferences, we have interests... And some of those interests are sparked by our surroundings. Like, maybe you'll watch Tide watching a good show. You're like, oh, what's that show? And then he'll tell you or send you a link. And then you'll go watch it. But you wouldn't have known about it if you hadn't have been watching it. Yeah, one of the best examples of that is product placement. I was just thinking of that advertising, yes. They would, like, for example, in a game show, you might see everyone with a fizz cup. Up, and they're like, mm, man, this is really good. And that's product placement. They're, they're either being paid or just generally like that product. Okay, so we have desires and interests, um, and so, and some some of those come from. So, so we manufacture some of those. Like you might have a good idea about the moon. Like, ooh, I want to look at the moon closer. I want a telescope. You know, you didn't have to have any advertising. You're just like, oh, I can't see the moon as good as I'd like to. Or I want to see the International Space Station. And so yeah. then the idea comes, you know, you basically work out the, the logistics, and you're like, okay, well, we're going to have to figure out how to get a better view of this stuff. That means we go get a telescope. So you can generate the, the interest internally, or you can, you can uh, see an ad... Or maybe someone else will be demonstrating a product like like those kids across the street. And that would be linking knowledge where, ooh, so I can't really see the moon very well or the ISS. Let's see, how would I be able to see it? And then you think, well, I know that telescopes and binoculars can make you look farther. That's linking information. You're taking the information of the... I can't see, I need to see farther, and then looking into your memories and noticing that, well, this, this thing can make you see farther, and you would decide, well, if this can make me see farther, but we don't have it, and it costs money, let's do something to get that. So you're making connections from, from previously unconnected pieces of information, and you're linking them together. Yeah, and so, like, you're wanting to see the moon or ISS has to cause you to buy a telescope or binoculars. Right. And the same thing could happen for people that like watching birds, or maybe you see an insect and you're like, what's it like to be that insect? Yeah, like, one of the best examples of that is a Mark Robert video. So he was bird watching. He decided that in COVID nineteen. Is he a bird watcher? He likes to watch birds. Yeah, he decided in COVID nineteen that it would be cool to watch birds. Okay. And and then came the squirrel. Oh, I thought you were gonna say then came the avian bird flu. Or what? the then came the bird flu. <laughs> no. But then came the Oh, squirrel. the squirrels came from him watching birds? And then he did his amazing squirrel Yeah. Uh what's that? 
What does he call it? Obstacle Squirrel obstacle course. Yeah, what happened is he was watching the birds <laughs> and he kept getting different bird feeders and they kept the feeding them all and he's like, all right, we need to make, we need to engineer a bunch of stuff. Okay, watching his stuff, he never really talks about his ultimate shield because none of his contraptions would work if he couldn't dictate the path of how those squirrels go. So he must have had an ultimate shield that was squirrel proof because the squirrels had to go from the beginning line and then go around in a certain order. And why would they have to do that if he didn't have ultimate squirrel shields? He actually does explain. Oh, he does? Yeah, he says that to make it so that they don't climb up. Oh, have you seen the second squirrel? I have, yeah. He was Mission Impossible. (laughs) (laughs) And it was like, he would make the 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 only other pearls slippery. Or have something like Mm. a slinky on them. (laughs) They couldn't get past the slinky, huh? The slinky is just like, (laughs) squirrels are like... What is this thing? <laughs> it, it looks like I should be able to stand on it, but it just... Because <laughs> when you think about a slinky, as it extends, the spiral parts on it actually go, like, extend, too. Yeah. Which really confuses the world. <laughs> but those things are freaking little yeah. acrobats. Or they also... Oh, yeah. The, um, remember the first one? Uh, Frank, one of the squirrels, decided that the be- his best course of action was to do about a ten foot jump <laughs> from the top of the roof of, on his garage. Oh my gosh! To uh, halfway through the obstacle course. Oh, and he says the squirrels are some of the few few creatures that doesn't matter how far they fall, they never get hurt, huh? Yeah, they can't. Like even if they fell. Uh, if they, even if they fell from, like, obviously, if they fell from space, they burn up in the atmosphere. Well, but only if they're going uh, fast relative to the surface. If they just drop straight down, I don't, well, they'd probably die of asphyxiation first. Yeah, but, <laughs> I mean, if they were, or like, they if they were in below orbit, space, oh, okay. like, uh-huh. they, could, they could still survive. Yeah, yeah. They could still So if you dropped down. them from, like, two miles up. They would live because they, probably live. they have mastered the laws of physics, and they'll always <laughs> lock their head on. I where love how he talks about that. Yeah. Yeah, they're like, really good. They uh, they use uh, the conservation of momentum, like how an ice skater would. Yep, so they can control their spin. And then once they're stop, they're not spinning. They use a combination of, of uh, unfurling like a parachute and tucking their tail in. Serious aerodynamics. Yeah. Uh, and they become effectively their own parachute. <laughs> That's so cool. Did you go with me to watch the guys doing the uh, iFly down in, down in downtown Ogden where they have that big chamber with glass walls and they have a big fan in the bottom and it blows so fast that no. people can fly? No. I don't think you we didn't did. go with me? Maybe I took Tide. Yeah, I, you didn't take me, I know that. Would you like to go see that? Oh, uh, yeah, I think I would. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> It'd be so fun. Well, so you've identified then, <coughs> you said linking... Information. Information, yeah. So, our minds, we can take various things, maybe one thing that we're interested in, and we can make connections, make intuitive leaps. Oh, if I, if I have to stay in my home because of COVID, um, there's a bird. I've never really taken the time to appreciate a bird. I'll go appreciate a bird. And then you notice the squirrels doing the cr- crazy things. And you start to appreciate squirrels and you start asking questions. You do that idea linking, huh? Yeah. And in the information linking. Like Mark Robert er, links the information of that the squirrels are defeating all of the bird feeders. Yes. And he decided to act on it by the, uh, making a obstacle course. I just made a link too because I would like to make a cat deterrent without having a door. I'd like to have like electric pads or <laughs> something that would keep the cats from coming into that furnace room and crapping and peeing in there. <laughs> One would. The best ever one. What? Uh, it's called a door handle. 
Oh my hell! That actually, I, you know what? Works. I was just thinking that as I'm going through it, I'm like, well, there's a door right there. Hmm. Guess I could actually close the door. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> like you really, Thomas? Need why do you think about the door. obvious things? Okay, fine. I was gonna science the hell out of it, and you're like, why don't you close the door, dummy? Don't pull apart the door. You have to over-engineer something like that. Uh, okay, over. maybe I'll shut the door. You talked me into it. Okay, so something like that. So how did we determine that that was a good idea? So there was, there's uh, effort involved. Like you did the calculation. You're like, okay, Dad has to go online and research electric mats. Or you put a fence up, and then you're like, well, wait a minute, at the door, there's already a door right there. Yeah, so what I did is I thought, well, the door, like, those little pads and stuff like that would be expensive. But uh-huh. we already have the door there, it's just that it's, it, like, its door lo- closing mechanism doesn't work. So right. if we just fix that, it, which would be very cheap. Then we'd isolate that spot then it would be a lot easier, and maybe cats can slightly turn doorknobs, but it's kind of hard for them. Yeah. So they would Especially really if they're full of crap or pee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't really want to <laughs> extend upwards. <laughs> like, seriously, yeah, try and stretch while you need to go to the bathroom. It's impossible. <laughs> so I got them. Okay. So you did, would you call that information linking, or would you say that you were influenced by the amount of effort it would have taken to science the crap out of it, do a Mo- Mark Roberg machine? I think I was looking linking the information that it's... You knew my purpose. I had purpose. I didn't want the cats to come and poop and pee, so you, you processed that. Yeah, I did. Uh-huh. I thought, well, that's a big problem. Right. The uh, room always smells like, like shit. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's right next to my room. I have to walk through it. And if I open the door to my room, they'd be doing it in there. Yeah. And then you might think, well, you see, it's a lot easier to fix the door because the whole reason that we do the rod thing is because the door doesn't really work. Right. So, okay, so you say that mostly the way that you processed that was you, you considered my purpose and you, yeah. you agreed with my purpose. I linked the information that you're a handyman and mom actually knows about oh, doorknobs because they used to work or at a company that would do few <laughs> doorknobs and stuff. That's and right. uh, I also linked the information that you may need to fix that door. Boom. Then you, that outputs the right answer. Yeah. Okay. Now, let me let me push that a little bit. And let's say, okay, so th- one thing that bothers me a bit is when, well, like we threw those popsicle sticks down there. Like you and Tide are kind of okay with garbage and dirty dishes being wherever. Oh, that's a trippy illusion. <laughs> where I am, it looks like the end, like the head of the spoon is towards that direction. And it looks like, <laughs> like this thing just like, it just vanishes. <laughs> Perspective. Yeah, that's trippy, man. Well, so yeah, we've got plenty of examples of dirty dishes around and garbage. So you guys are okay with it. And in my brain, I'm like, no, that's not okay. We need to live in a clean area. Although, in my room, I've got all my crap that I just piled there. And I haven't organized that. It's kind of gridlocked. So let's let's use the example of the table out there where the computer is. Yeah. Or maybe the table over here below, below the TV. Yeah. It's always cluttered. It's always a mess. So... You guys have done a calculation, obviously, that you've said, eh, doesn't really matter. Yeah, like, we don't use that much of the table at a time. Right, okay. And uh, we don't really use that coffee table at all. So I think the there's, there's disgust involved or distaste of work. Like, in your mind, because in my mind, it's pretty simple to just take a few minutes, clean that up, and then instead of spending hours and hours in a cramped space, you're spending hours and hours in a nice, clear space. Yeah. So to me, the investment of putting in a little bit of work is, is worth a big payoff. So I was curious, what is it that makes you decide 
that the investment isn't worth it? Is it um, is it disgust or distaste of of you know changing switching gears? Like you're so interested in your video game or your YouTube thing that the idea mm. of what? I just thought that also links to the moral thing. So yeah, yeah. another part of it is result. So. Well, like you just said, there's either spend a b- not much time to have a clean table for hours, or don't spend any time to have a dirty table for, for a few hours. So results. Result, yeah. Just tell me more about that. So. Oh, there can be a result that would be considered bad in pretty much everywhere. And not just because someone thinks that that, like, it's just because it's pretty obvious. So consensus, you'd have a lot of people agreeing with that idea. Yeah, you'd you'd agree that, well, the result shows that if you you shoot someone in the head, in the head, then uh, they don't have a life anymore, and you which might be isn't good for them because yeah. they are now dead. Right, and you might be susceptible to getting shot in the head, or you'd have to get guns to protect yourself. And yeah, like a lot of the laws that, well, not a lot, but some of the laws that governments make don't make much sense, or or are or just don't really. Yeah, they're not really true. Mm-hmm. But, uh, for example, murder is definitely a good law. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, you should, if you kill someone, you should definitely be arrested for it. Okay, so so now that you're getting into law, let me ask you this. If there were no law against murder, like if there was no police force, no jails, no judges, no lawyers, no Congress people, no senators, no bureaucrats, to process taxes and all that stuff. So anarchy, basically. Well, you know what anarchy means? Uh, basically, well, I kind of do. Oh, sorry, sorry. There, there are several meanings for anarchy, but you know the official, uh, oh gosh, official. That official. The, that makes you think. Well, is that the one that you know the popular definition or? So I guess I'm asking. Do you know what anarchy the word means? Like the actual Latin word. Um, something about rebelling against the government, kind of. It's I think N is the first part, and that means no, it means without, and archi means refer to ruler. So anarchy literally means without a ruler. Yeah, that's basically what I meant. Oh, okay. So. Because I learned in class that there are a few forms of governance. Mm-hmm. Anarchy is no government at all. The town is the government. The entire town. Mm. Every person that lives there decides what they want to do. Then there's small governments, big governments, and uh, somewhere in the in between. So, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of times people associate anarchy with chaos. Yeah, because really everyone decides what they want to do, which is usually their own ambitious is intent. But look at this family. Is there a coercive government that tells you how you have to do things? Or is it more anarchy? Well, in this family, it's more anarchy to a lower state. It's not like we can do whatever we want. Really? It's partially. <laughs> Because we can do whatever we want, except for what uh, to the government say are bad. Well, okay, so so imagine we take our family situation, or, or like when Mom and I were taking you guys to church, there was no coercive organization running the church. It was all voluntary. People would show up there because they chose to. Um, so imagine that all the laws, all the governments were gone. And all you had was organizations like a family or like a church or the town, community, whatever. Do you think that people would be okay with murder at that point? Well, no. What, Although, what do you think we'd do if we found someone who murdered? Well, 
that actually depends. Um, so, like, for Is example, you're if you're in the middle of a food crisis, then one less person <laughs> would be <laughs> one less they mouth be like, oh, Thanks eat. for solving part of our problem there, babe. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, if it's not, then a lot of people in the town would say, get out of here, go to a different place. Exactly, exactly. We yeah. you don't want people like you around. Right, so the laws have given more structure to something that already exists, which is a pretty good consensus on moral processing that murder is a bad idea. Yeah. That's really gross. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for displaying that for me. <laughs> what? You sicko. <laughs> you, you, you spit muncher. Um, okay, okay, okay. So, what, did, what was the last thing we came up with? Result. Result, thank you. Result. So, I'm still unclear as to how we can formulate, how, how can formulate result into all of this. So, how would you say that better? Like, people consider results of behaviors in their moral decisions, in their moral analysis. Yeah. One of, of the representations of result is Chekhov's gun. In an animation, or really anything, if something's in the... Oh, like, one of the reasons why Breaking Bad was one of the best shows was because the it, oh, everything that you see was, uh, was relevant later. Like, and you can actually see that in Star Wars, too. Like, like I had watched the entirety of season one of The Mandalorian, and there was this one droid. And then, in... The, in the uh, first, like in the movie where uh, they first blow up the Death Star, um, I saw uh, that while well, parts of the three PO were going in, uh, were gonna go into the fire, I think. Um, I saw in the back that same model of droid. Mm, so it's consistent. Yeah, I saw, and it even looked like that exact droid. And mm. it was consistent, yeah. Okay, so results. So as we're doing our moral analysis to decide if something's good or bad, we will consider um, a, the story. We, we've already mentioned story. We'll consider, and, and that's, that's interesting too, because as we're dealing with each other, sometimes we'll lie to each other. And, and we'll analyze, we kind of have a truthometer. And if we suspect that maybe someone's not telling the truth, then our, our warning flashers go off and we start digging for the truth. And we look for consistency. Like if I say, oh, yeah. I, I've been in Salt Lake all day, but you know for a fact that I've been here all day. You're like, well, that's yeah. not true. And, uh, for example, when Tide says, I'll be on for just a little bit longer, and then 30 minutes later, mm -hmm. he's still mm -hmm. on, you can draw a link that, well, eh, that's not our 30 minutes isn't really not that long. Okay, so how does that tie into results? That ties into results by you don't get a turn okay. for what you were promised. Okay, so You were promised not very long, and so you got 30 minutes. So that's another thing that comes in. It contracts, deals that we can make with each other, and reputation, uh, credit. All that comes in. So, if I say, Thomas, I will not be home until 8 o'clock. And then I say, uh, you know what, I'm going to be sleeping in Salt Lake. Yeah, like, oh, that actually happens a lot of the time. You're like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to be home at about 8. And you come home tomorrow. <laughs> at right. The so, what does that mean for my credit? Well,. It, to your credit, it makes you not very trustworthy all the yeah, time. Yeah, so my credit goes down time. with estimation. Yeah, and you can basically imagine you know, credit like a game of stats. And you can have credit in multiple things. So if you have credit in time, and right. then you say, well, I'm going to be here at 8, and then you're not there at 8, that, that lowers that 
wasted right. time reputation. And if I say I care about you, but then I never talk to you, I never do anything that you're interested in, I never ask about your life. That stuff go, gets then lower. lower. That stuff gets lower. Yeah. So we have a reputation tied up with a lot of different, a lot of different results. Yeah. We do result analysis. Man, there's a lot of R's in the... <laughs> <laughs> it goes like something O R R R R R R R I O. Well, I L. That sounds like a good password. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be our new password. <laughs> well, so I'm doing this because I want to I want to build, if possible, a prime radiant, uh, which would be like a like a periodic table for morality. So if we had something we could look at um, that was as cool as the periodic table that we could say, okay, so what's going on with you? Well, I'm really sad. Oh. Well, let's, let's do a little checkup. And we can go through the prime rating to see how your moral analysis works. Or maybe it's really obvious. I mean, maybe it's like, oh, my wife just died, or my kids just died, or I just lost all my money, or... Um, I just did something terrible, you know, maybe I should or rob like the bank. I'm in debt. I'm in debt, yeah. So there might be some big event that's bringing you down, but if people are, like, if they've been depressed for a long time, um, it'd be cool if you had something like the prime radio that you could say, all right, well, would you like to do some moral analysis here and, and see how you're doing with... Because I guess that's the thing. That's the result that I'm after is I want a, a formula that we can put in the data from our life and it would spit out a result of how happy, how happy we could expect to be based on the moral decisions we've been making. Yeah. And, and then you could expand that to a family or you could expand that to a community or even to a nation. And you could say, okay, you know, how wealthy are you guys? How... How kind are you? How happy is everybody? Yeah, and you can, in that logic, you can say that morality is, the, like, if you have a good morality, then that means that you do stuff that makes you and others around you happy, or in a better situation in life. Yeah. Yeah, it has a positive result. Um... Now, how again, that's back to our good or bad ometer. How do you judge a result as being yeah. good or bad? Because that's what just what you decide. Right, and we're starting to an- analyze the various things that go into that decision of, oh, this is a, this is a good result, or this is a bad result. Like, <laughs> I was thinking of... Yeah, your, this is like trying to solve rocket science. I know, it, that's why I needed your help. Yeah. Because uh, one brain, thinking about this, I don't go very far, but if I have another mind I can bounce it off of, then it really helps. Yeah, because you can be thinking of your stuff, yes. and I can be thinking of other stuff. And we can information link. You can be talking to me, and I can be processing that information, mm-hmm. and then thinking, well, this links to this, mm-hmm. or this this could lead to this. Right. And uh, we could do another, we could add another factor. Yep. Yep, and and I guess, see, <clears throat> I've got a few a few aces up my sleeve for this game because, on some level, I think the answers are fairly simple. Um, because, like with any science, so you talked about people in the past that maybe weren't as smart as we are. I used to have that idea when I learned. Uh, I, I don't know who it was. Maybe my grandma, Smith, was telling me how they used to use oil lamps. That was their light, you know. They didn't have electricity. They would, uh, if they needed to, if the sun went down, they would find an oil lamp or a yeah. candle. In fact, like, a lot of the times, even before we were talking about this stuff, I would think, in, in, man, it'd be really cool to go into the past and say, Whoa! Look at all this technology we have, and they just wouldn't understand it because, yeah. like, for example, there was some shows that nowadays could be remade easily yeah, for no money almost uh, in just some random dude's uh, garage. Yeah, yeah. We've got so many conveniences, 
And I remember, I think, I think it was about the lamp thing. And I'm like, Grandma, why didn't they just turn on the light? And she's like, well, Donnie, we didn't have lights back then. We didn't have electricity. I'm like, what? How dumb were people back then? Yeah. And she's like, oh, no, people were not dumb. They were brilliant. They were coming up with all sorts of discoveries. And what I've realized is that um, we have the benefit of inheriting information. Yeah, and that information, at first glance, you might think, yeah, those people weren't very smart. They should just find out how to use electricity. Mm-hmm. But from their perspective, oil lamps and stuff, like candles, were uh-huh. perfectly fine. And then right. they realized, well, what impact is this having? on the world. Oh, and that can be another thing we can add to our morality thing. Yeah, yeah. Impact. Impact. And we can say, well... It's well, kind of a subset of result, almost. Yeah, and they... No, it isn't, is it? Because you have your result is like what it does for you, but impact is like what effect does it have on the world. Yeah, and they decided, well, look at it, all of this oil that's being used. And you know where they got a lot of their oil? Out. They got a lot of their oil from whales. Yeah, and you might realize that, oh shoot, the whales aren't coming around as often now. And uh, eventually there's there will be an oil deficiency, and people would say, well, we need to find another electricity. Like, we need to find another light source. Another source fast. of power, yeah. yeah. And then That's they right. found about electricity and how certain things can cause electricity, like... Take, for example, how oh, uh, you can make fire with, uh, with two stones. Yep. And, and then I was blown away when I, I, I don't know why, when I was like 25, and I sure, I'm sure I've heard of it before, but if you have a magnetic field and you, you pass a wire through that magnetic field, it'll induce an electric current on that wire. Yeah. And that's how generators work. You'll have a coil of wires, and people will pass that next to a permanent magnet. Like in a windmill, they'll run that passed over and over and over again, and it induces an electric current, which you can then power stuff with. Yeah, and it's really cool that no matter how many ideas we think of, it just simply doesn't work making infinite electricity. There's so, like, for example, you might think, what about a water wheel, and you use it to power itself, and then you realize, oh, once the water goes down, you need a power source to, to get up. it back up <laughs> because of gravity. Uh-huh. And then you realize, so well... all your gains well, turn into losses. Yeah, it's like trying to create a portal. You need it to have positive and negative matter. <laughs> We're back to anti I suddenly <laughs> start talking about quantum <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry, my left nut just got a little negative. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Family friendly. Family friendly. <laughs> family friendly. Okay. <laughs> We had a very interesting conversation <laughs> yesterday. Let's not talk about, about Sonic. About going fast in the speed of light. <laughs> and, and you're below the belt. Oh, okay. see, <laughs> right, 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 right. Okay, left and right foot. We're not going to talk about that at all. Okay, so you brought up impact. Speaking of impact. <laughs> impact. So, no. So they may, have, uh, they may have considered the fact that the whales weren't coming around as much. I'm sure they, their tactic was they go out in their boat and they have some guys like, hey, whale, come on over. I got something for you. And eventually the whales are onto them. They're like, no, you're going to stab that thing at me if I come near you. Yeah. It's like how over a lot of years um, things can evolve to their natural environment if that thing keeps happening. I'm going to make one of the cheese pizzas. How cheesy. I'm going to eat the cheese pizzas, and then we have diced bacon. Oh. Nice. We also have sausage that I just cooked up, if you want to put that on there. Okay. It's in the meat drawer. That one? What? That one? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so impact, I like that. So people will sometimes consider their environment, and it, it could be like... Oh, our neighbor is changing his oil in his driveway, and he's just dumping his oil all over the ground. And now that oil is seeping over into my grass, and now my grass is dying. So we can look at a local impact. We can look at even noise impact. Like if I'm walking around 
playing my music or lectures or whatever I'm listening to, my movie, if I'm playing that super loud, that impacts you. Yeah. And so you might be like, hey, that's a bad moral analysis. You need to use earphones so that you're not impacting the rest of the world here. So impact is a part of it. Okay. See, Thomas, this is interesting because as you've been talking to me, it's boosted my confidence that morality could really be a science. Because even though there are a lot of pieces to it, there's not infinite pieces. Yeah, although there can be... Well, I did learn that there can be smaller and bigger infinities. Right, right. And, and, and I mean, you're right. There could be so many pieces that we'll never really get a grasp on it. But my hope... And that see, this is this is where I get excited with the periodic table idea because there were so there's so many elements out there. They're like, well, how do these things all interact? You know, how are we going to put this together into into a a framework that could be useful? So it's kind of similar. There's kind of a good analogy to the the uh, periodic table. Yeah, and one of the strongest things that points to impact would be annoyance. <laughs> so if you're annoying someone <laughs> doing this, like, <laughs> and oh, they're like, stop okay, it. Okay, but that also brings up empathy and sympathy. Yeah. So, so, so if someone is impacting you, like mom, she doesn't uh, talk to grandpa and grandma anymore, because of the impact that their moral analysis had on Riley. Riley was very sad that they wouldn't acknowledge their choice of gender. Um, and so mom's like, well, look, if you're not going to... If you're not going to allow our kid to choose their own identity, their sexual identity, then that's a deal-breaker. And so the impact on one person affected mom, which affected the whole family, because she's like, we're not going over to grandpa and grandma's. Yeah. So, empathy is where you can feel how someone else might feel. And that's where... Yeah. A lot of people describe empathy like putting yourself in, in the someone else's shoes. Which is, I think, what grandpa and grandma didn't do for Riley, or for mom. Yeah. They want... They want mom to feel empathy for them, but not they don't want to do it the other way around. Yeah, and that's also kind of that also ties into some animals like mutualism and parasitism or whatever it's called and communism. Where mutualism is where both of the species are like a a okay with each other and yeah. help each other out. One yeah. is one gets help, and the other is neither harmed or helped. And then there's, there's uh, parasitism, which is one creature is helped and the other is harmed. And uh, we call it parasitism because parasites yeah. are, are uh, the main representation of parasitism. Yeah. We call it after them, and it's a great representation because... Parasites latch on to animals and sometimes even humans, and the, they might inject viruses in them. Or parasites suck. Yeah. Dad? <laughs> no, don't beat your father. <laughs> that's bad, that's bad. Why is your goodometer saying that's good? <laughs> Well, it's making you happy, so is it really bad? Oh, you're funny. Yeah, that's interesting. So is it going to be too complicated, or, like, how many elements are there? There's, like, on that periodic table, there's, like, 50. Oh, I was going to say 80. Maybe 50, maybe 80. There's yeah, a lot. There's a lot. Between 50 and 100... Probably not more than a hundred. Oh, I think there actually are, but they're like exotic ones that you got to create in the lab. Like exotic negative math. Well, they're not that exotic. Yeah, not that. These, these are ones they can actually build in a super collider or something. Yeah, like you can't obviously stumble upon the material of a black hole, but you can create a tiny, 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 tiny 
micro black hole in a lab. You can? Yes. Serious? They made little tiny ones in the lab? Yeah, um, they, but sadly, they only last and for tiny not sadly, they only, they, they evaporate only, almost instantly, right? Yeah, they, have, they appear and evaporate in nanoseconds right. because of Hawking radiation. Which speeds up when they're small, but it slows down when they're large. Yeah, because eventually the input of how much matter they can consume yeah. overweighs Hawking radiation. It slows it right down. Which overweighs them. Um, uh, go, oh. So instead of them uh, um, uh, getting in smaller, they get bigger and bigger. And as they as get bigger, they get bigger them. faster. But because you, they have to consume more and more, they grow at the exact same rate. Even though they should, like, it, uh, if a sphere didn't work that way, then you, they, it would get, it, it would it'd start to get faster and infinitely faster. You know, I just realized that black holes are probably the best argument for the flat earthers. Because <laughs> a black hole... The force of gravity pulls in all directions towards a single point, and it, it doesn't tend to make a flat sheet of paper, it tends to make a dot or a sphere, and that's how gravity works. It pulls towards one single point, and that tends to end up, well, sometimes a peanut, while the while the gravitational if, force is low. Flat Earthers just thought that there was a big black hole on Earth, or Earth, and that's what's keeping all the water or it and stuff. Thomas, you're progressing. You don't say Earth much anymore. You say Earth. Yeah, Earth. But like a year ago, you used to say Earth. Earth. Yeah, I yeah, did. You did. Like, you just figured that out. Earth. Yeah, we didn't bug you too much about it because we thought it was kind of cute. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, can you talk about Earth with me? <laughs> Black holes. <laughs> It's so, it's so fun listening to Isaac Alto talking about <laughs> particle physics and stuff. He, he is a physicist. Particle physics. I think he is a physicist. Particle physics. Yeah, he's, a, he's quite a brilliant guy. Isaac Alto. Alto. Well, Thomas, this is really good. So, impact. Did we, did we add anything after impact? Oh, empathy. Yeah. How much? So, so we do. So that that's interesting because we are all moral processors. We're doing. We're we're including all these elements in our moral analysis. Sometimes we don't have enough, as much empathy. Sometimes we don't consider the impact. Sometimes we don't consider the result. Like I think that's what. Another thing we can add is consideration. How's that different than empathy? Might well, be, might be different. Huh? It can be considering different things, not just what people might feel, okay. but it can, you can, if, if you stop and consider what would happen if you did this thing, like, it can be talking about you. So, for example, there's this one game, it's a FNAF game, it, I think it's the, well, it's not the newest game, because, um, Security Breach is coming out. It mm -hmm. hasn't come out yet, but it is. But the second newest game, uh -huh. um, FNAF VR, Help Wanted, is at one point, like, there was a Halloween update, and there was, it was this big corn maze, and there was, like, Ignited Foxy in it, pretty much. Um, Jacko Foxy. Uh -huh. And Jacko Foxy would chase you down in the maze, and there was things you could hide in. Did Jackal Foxy light up the world as you went by? Yes. Oh. And... Whatever. Well, it would have been a misnomer if he hadn't had he a... He kind of actually he does, though. He like wasn't he, a light source. Yeah, he has light around him because he's literally on fire. Okay. Anyways, though, um, like, uh, maybe it, he spotted you, and he can charge faster than you can run. And if he sees you, uh -huh. and you're right in front of one of the things you can hide in. And you have to choose, at that point, you have to make a, make a choice and consider what you do. Either get in and be safe, and you wouldn't lose, or, or try and run away, 
as Foxy charges at you and you lose. Well, that seems like an easy one. <laughs> yeah, but you have. But think about it. If you don't, cons- if you uh, can't consider fast enough, and if you consider for that to. Like, okay, so yeah. if you panic, you might make the wrong choice because yeah. you didn't consider you didn't consider the results or the consequences. And so, as smart as we are, we're not. We don't have the reaction time of a squirrel hopping through trees. Is uh, in fractions of seconds. We don't yeah, have reaction awesome. time like that. Okay, so so reaction time, I remember as a teenager, this is, I don't know if this is a part of it, but it, you just reminded me that I would have an awkward time in social situations because sometimes I wouldn't consider other people's feelings. Like there was this one time, this was Thanksgiving, and my brother, your Uncle Richard, his girlfriend at the time, who later became his wife, Aunt Jody, um, oh my gosh, was I, I might have been getting ready for my mission. I, I want to say I was a young teenager, like 14 or 15. I think someone had just got a trench coat, and they said it was double-breasted. And I said, oh, like Jody. <laughs> <laughs> and this was at Thanksgiving. So someone was demonstrating their trench coat. And it was a double-breasted trench coat, which means it wraps around your chest or whatever. And I said, oh, it's double-breasted, like Jody." Okay. <laughs> and she, fortunately, she laughed, but I felt so stupid. I felt so inconsiderate because... They, people talk about the brain mouth filter, like you get an idea, but some ideas shouldn't be said. Yeah, and that's oh, the odd ones out. Actually, talked about that in one of his videos. The brain mouth filter. Though no, c- kind of like that, but it's where you're about to do something, and then you realize at the last second, at the time where you don't have control of the situation anymore, you've <laughs> already started to do it. <laughs> Uh oh! This is a bad idea. I shouldn't do this. In the end, in the, like in the voiceover, he only talked about how if you're about to step on a bee, like a, you're because of gravity and stuff, you're already falling towards it, but you can't do anything about it, and you realize, uh oh. But in the animation, it shows that and. Like if you were working on a drawing and then you uh, and the, you accidentally press save without quitting and then you're about to press OK and then you realize uh oh and you lose all and your you stuff. lose all the oh, progress. That suck. You know what? I had a stupid moment like that with the bee, with the bumblebee actually. I've never gotten stung once in my life. So I was out in our milk barn. It's an old barn by our old house and. I was with my cousin. Oh, sorry, my old house. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I was with my cousin Jennifer, and there's a bunch of crap in that. Oh, yeah, you are so disgusting. Sorry. That is the grossest thing ever. What? <laughs> oh, you're gross. Okay, so we were out there, and we found these two little badminton rackets. It's like little tennis rackets, and there were, and there was a bumblebee that was that had flown in through the open door or something, or maybe there was a nest in there. I didn't know. But anyway, this bumblebee's flying around in there, and we got the brilliant idea, hey, that bumblebee's like a little tennis ball. <laughs> so I hit it towards Jennifer. She hit it back towards me, and the poor thing's just trying to fly, you know. And I hit it back to her, and she hits it to me. I hit it back to her, and it takes revenge. <laughs> it's like, screw this. And it went and stung her. Ooh. And that's where I'm like, oh. Consideration zero. <laughs> yeah, you didn't consider the output right. of what would happen. The results, yeah. And that can be half consideration, half empathy, because you might think, well, if I was in their shoes, they could, uh, they could have been stunned. Um, but or empathy for the bumblebee. Yeah, or you would think, well, there's a chance that as it's getting hit towards me, it could decide to sting me. So, in a, uh, you either have to choose, do I choose, uh, like, you, it can be, be chosen as either empathy or consideration, because as, uh, when you think about it, 
empathy, you're thinking about someone else and how it would be to them. And you might realize, well, if it's seeing them, then it was my fault. But then you might realize that if it stings me, it was kind of also my fault. Should I keep doing this? Okay, so you're, there's, you're sparking some ideas in my head. So we also have, um, you said reaction time. Reaction time ties into that, too. It like, does. Because you're still hitting around while thinking that, and then you need to decide quickly what you do. Yeah, so you have reaction time, and then you've also got experience, and then you said blame, which made me think of responsibility and guilt. Guilt yeah. is a big part of our moral analysis. Because if I can get you to feel guilty, then I can control you. Yeah, guilt and is one of the best things that can control someone. Right. If you can make me feel guilty about what I'm doing, then we have a consensus on my moral behavior as being bad. And then you, you can say, oh, I now have the moral high ground, and ch you chop off my legs. What? <laughs> Sorry, I just switched to Star Wars. <laughs> I have the high ground. Well, why does that matter? <laughs> uh, it just does. <laughs> I have the high ground. And, uh, okay, but I can chop off your legs now, and you can... Like, Minecraft physics also... Like, if you're trying to PvP someone, and your opponent is on top of the high ground... Yeah. They don't have an advantage. You no, do. You think that they'd have better access to you chopping off your kneecaps or something, huh? Yeah, because um, in Minecraft, like, you suddenly, they have a little less range because of the vector of a triangle, but uh, you have more range because you now have more range against, you just, you have the same range. But uh, they have a little less range than you. And you've got the critical hit advantage, too. You drop yeah. them down on their head. Because if they jump up, suddenly they can barely hit you. Like, while trying to kill an iron golem, if you go up four blocks instead I hate those of... Guys. But if you go up four blocks instead of three blocks, what it's extremely crouch? hard to hit. Yeah, even that, with crouching, it's extremely hard to hit them with a crit. Because by the time you're about to hit the ground, when you swing, you're usually on the ground. Because humans don't have a very good reaction time. Humans? Iron, go iron golems and humans? Humans don't have very any good reaction time at oh, I see. clicking when the... <laughs> I see. Sorry, I'm, I, I imagine a human falling as they're trying to crackle hit an iron golem. Like, um, that's two different universes you just smashed together in my brain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Reaction time. You weren't considering <laughs> anything. Uh, my reaction time was a little slower than yours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, thinking of this clear explanation, and you're like, wait, so iron golems exist? Well, okay, so that brings up something else, point of view or perspective. Yeah. Which is why I say so many bad jokes, because I have fun playing with words. And you don't always have that same perspective. You're starting to get it, and you're starting to make bad jokes, too. I've been doing it for a while. You have been, actually. So, in some ways, our perspectives, you're starting to see different perspectives that I've enjoyed. And, obviously, you're going to have a different perspective overall. Like, you you have a different knowledge set. You know a whole lot more about those songs that you and Tide do your song game about. And you, you know all kinds of things that I don't know. Yeah, and the best representation of, of p point of view, POV is an argument. So you're arguing about something like cranberry pie or something. <laughs> I don't know. And we're doing it from our point of view. Yeah, well, you're like, well, I like apple pie. And you're like, cranberry pie is better. And you have an argument. And you're like, cranberry pie. And they're like, apple pie. Your apple pie can go to hell. Yeah, and you try and bring up points about it, like right. apple pie is more nutritious and stuff for Sounds you. Sounds like advertising. It kind of is. And when you, if you win the argument, then they'll probably say, fine, I'll eat some apple pie. <laughs> and they might taste it and say, it's pretty good. 
and they might uh, revert from their cranberry point of view to your apple pie point you of view. You managed to shift their point of view. And then that or- argument mm-hmm. can go on, and, uh, and you can spread that uh, to, well, I used to like cranberry pie, but apple pie is better. And you can spread that rumor with another person, and, like one of your friends. And then they can share it to their friends. And on and yeah, on. and that ties into the experience point. I wanted to bring that up because, at, so there's reaction time. Like you're, like you, you look at Groundhog Day, and as the guy's going through the day for the first time, like he does all sorts of stupid stuff. <laughs> yeah, like remember when his foot actually fell like <laughs> yeah. in that mud pool? Yeah, and, and then the day after day, he kept falling, stuffing in the same hole, but. And so, so when you're going through things on your own for the very first time, you're left with very few resources. All you have is your experience, which is, this was a new experience, so you have zero experience. And then you also have your reaction time. But if you can yeah, learn... I just thought of something. If you can learn from your past experience, what? Whoa. What? I just thought of that... Once I was dreaming about, like, this map or something, and, uh, like, it's, like, and then later, like, two days later or something, Mm -hmm. um, there it was, that exact map. And I just thought of something. What if, because the speed of thought is about the exact speed of light. What if you can actually see the future slightly with your brain, like in your dreams. That'd be a dreams. cool trick. You would you would actually make a lot of money in Las Vegas. Why? Because that's what making money is all about in Las Vegas. They'll spin this marble, and if you can predict where it's going to land, and you you put a bet on that spot, and then they'll give you a vast multiple of your dollars. That's not called getting money. That's called gambling. That's they either take or give. So gambling. Sure. That's, I'm saying, if you ever get to where you can predict the future, just let me know. Well, we'll, we'll have to take a trip to Las I Vegas. I think it might only be in dreams, though, because, you know, like, the speed of thought is very fast. Okay, that, that actually does bring up another point, which is, um, uh, oh, what's it called? It's like when... Oh, Your speed of thought isn't going very fast, is it? It's biased. No, <laughs> it, I, had to, I had to rewind a few brain cells and get them into organization. Um, it's, it's confirmation bias. So when there's something that you want, like the, you want the world to be a certain way, uh, sometimes you will notice things that give, that reinforce that point of view. So I want everybody to be a Mormon. I'm going to look for reasons why Mormonism is good. But if I have a more scientific perspective and I just want people to be happy, then I might more look more objectively at Mormonism and say, well, wait a minute, is there actually any evidence here? Um, so confirmation bias, like you have that dream and you remember you had a dream about a map, but then you see a map and you're like, oh, that was the exact map. But your brain might have just shifted the details of your dream map to match the map that you see and tells you, it hands you a story. And it says, that was the exact map. Oh my gosh, you were predicting the future. Because that's a pretty cool story. Yeah, and uh, you do some kids and uh, like do sometimes have wild imaginations. Mm-hmm. And sometimes our our memories will edit themselves to match our confirmation bias, our, our the things that we want to have happen, or, or the things that we want to be. Mm. So that's another part of it. Um, another part of of that. So, talking about how you talked about, like, like, uh, like how, you know, when you think about good arguments for why God exists or something, yeah. it doesn't really work out. But the opposite can kind of happen, for example, with flat earthers. They're like, well, you should believe us because of all this. And they bring up good points about how, like, the water doesn't fall off because there's this big wall of ice. Right. Ice everywhere, right. and you think, well, I haven't seen a big wall of ice, but then again, I haven't gone very far out from where I normally go, so there's right. no evidence proving that it doesn't exist. 
and then you might think, well, the sun, um, it might work like a spotlight, kind of, like, I don't know how, what it's doing on the other side, yeah, like, on, a big disc, on the other place of your... the sun's going by, we could be on the outside of the big wheel. Yeah, but then when you actually start thinking about it with real logic, like, it could, they didn't think, oh, our logic is contradicting ourselves because they just... Sometimes you can think, oh, this is what science is, and this is how this works. When really, it's just not. And you be, you just think that is how it works when it's not. Okay, so now you're bringing self-esteem into it. Why do we have confirmation bias? Why do we care that things are a certain way? Because why do we want to be right? Why do we not like it when we're wrong? Because you learn things both ways. But why do we care so much when we're right? It's because it feeds our self-esteem. Yeah, another word for that is also ego. Right. And so if your ego is super low, or your self-esteem is low, then you don't think that you're worth living. You don't think you're a worthwhile individual. Yeah. So we strive to find things to feed our ego, our self-esteem, to keep us alive, to keep us thinking that we're worthwhile. Yeah. And some people tie a, a, a result, or they'll try to change a result, just to make their self-esteem happy. Yeah, something like that is, like, to be honest, in my head, the best, very best representation of that is, so there's a group of people that think that a thing called reality shifting Oh, I saw, I saw... Yeah. No, no, no. I heard, yeah. you, I heard you watching that one. Tell me... Oh, what's the guy... What's the animator's name? The, the Odd One's Out. Odd One's Out, yeah. I heard you listening to that, and that sounded so interesting. Yeah, so people think that you can't... Like, if you focus hard enough and stuff, you can... <laughs> like, while in uh, bed and stuff, you can go in it. Best friends with, uh, with uh, yeah. Malfoy. Yeah. <laughs> and you think, well, we have proof that this works because people have done it before and I can do it and it works. When really all you're doing is uh, is, is dreaming. Yeah, there is no proof because all you're hearing is subjective. It's just like testimony meeting at church. People would say, oh, I saw an angel or I heard a voice or God helped me find my tweezers that I was looking for. Yeah, but that's just, I can't remember what it's called, but it's where you're told this will happen, and your brain starts to think, well, it should happen right about now, so it's probably going to happen, and then that thing happens, whether it's auditory, uh, visual, mm -hmm. or, or uh, touch-based. Yeah. And uh, you might hear, feel, or see those things. Things because your brain is tricking itself into seeing those things because yeah. it thinks it'll happen. It's trying to trying to make reality match your prediction. And the opposite of that can also happen, where uh, you're perfectly fine, and then doctors like give you a pill or something and say this pill will give you a headache, and you start to see see signs of a headache. Did but that really, you? that pill did nothing at all. It was a placebo. Yeah. Yeah. Did I tell you about my mom's uh, story about when she went to college, psycholo it was like a college psychology class, and the professor said, first thing in class today, I want you all to roll up your sleeves, I'm going to put a small drop of this liquid on your arm, and I want you to watch, it's a very, very, very mild acid, it won't harm you, but it will turn your skin slightly pink, and I guess there weren't many... Uh, there, most everybody there was Caucasian, but your white white skinned people there. And he goes, okay, so we're, I'm sending my assistant around. I'll go this way, and we're going to put one drop. And I just want you to raise your arm, not the arm that the drops on, but the other arm. Raise your arm as soon as this starts to discolor, as soon as it starts to go a little bit pink. And after just a couple minutes, someone's arm went up, and then another person's arm went up, and pretty soon the whole room, uh, yep. My arm's pink now. When really, it was just water. It was. Yeah, and I've actually experienced the placebo effect firsthand. Seriously. Because, like, once I... I... I'm sorry, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I had a headache, and I felt like I was about to barf. Yeah. Or, and then I was just thinking of other stuff, and I realized that I don't really feel the headache. 
school. And uh, you realize you didn't feel the headache? Yeah, and then I just decided I am um, oh I am I do not have a headache. And it started to go away a little bit. Serious? You just, just kind of bit. psyched yourself out. Yeah, and that's also uh, how people can actually uh, just stab yourself with a needle and not care at all. It makes you wonder what is what we're capable of. Yeah, because there's like, a lot of that just, stuff, like headaches yeah. and pain, is something that your brain deals with. And if your brain decides, uh, well... Um, I'm just going to make it so that you don't feel pain where your headache is or you don't feel pain where that needle is. Is because your brain controls pain and decides, ah, that's pain, don't do that, that's bad. Which also keeps us alive. But you can just say, uh, I don't care, brain, uh, don't do that. And... Uh, and uh, you can make it so that you don't might not feel pain there or pain in in, um, in your head. There is pizza. We heard. Thank pizza. you, thank you. That's amazing. Right. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of crazy to think uh, what we're capable of. You you bring up another real basic element, which is the pleasure and pain response. So that's got to be a part of our moral analysis, because obviously. Y- your reaction time comes into it quickly, like if you're getting a burn, or if you're st- you're getting stung by a bee, or if you're stepping on a uh, you get a, uh, a a splinter in your hand, a sliver, um, or if you smash your thumb with a hammer, or if you stub your toe, you have a very instant moral analysis. <laughs> yeah, and that's why the whole, well, that's why some people exist that don't feel pain. It's because uh, their brain just can't c- uh, process pain. Wow, that's pretty wild. Yeah, those people actually exist. And you might sometimes she- see shows with people just laying on a bed uh, of uh, spikes. Like, not spikes that will go straight through them or really pierce the skin too badly. Yeah. But just draw a tiny bit of blood, and they just don't care at all. They don't flinch or well, what anything. about the people that climb into a big tub of frozen water or ice cold water you seen that one they'll 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 either get into a frozen lake or they'll have yeah. a tub of ice water and they'll climb in they're just like just fine their teeth aren't chattering they're not shivering yeah and that doesn't just have to be if you can't sense pain right that can also be if you're more resilient to it if your body's more used to it in fact yeah you like to think the first time we filled up the pool yeah um, in the backyard, it was freezing cold, and uh, to tide. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if I could have like five bucks. What do you think I am in bank? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's um, fine. Thanks. I, I'll give you another drawing. Um, yep. Let me. Um. Ooh, could you give me a little tiny one? Yeah, let me, um, I'm kidding. No, no, thank you. Um, that was really useful. Um, Anyways, I yeah. wanted to play, continue that Buggles and Fizzles. The Buggles and Fizzles? Yeah, we need to. Sounds pretty good. Well, I got a lot of noteworthy notes. So, that was useful. Um, okay, we got the moral problem right now. Should we play Buggles, buggles and Fizzles? Or well, if you're just waiting for sage and stuff, then well, I'm not just waiting for sage, but so I need to make a moral analysis of all the results that I want to have happen today, like laundry. Yeah, you have to consider what will happen. <laughs> I have to, I have to. Im- what was it? Information. Link. Linking. Linking yeah, I have to link the fact that my room smells like dirty laundry, <laughs> and I have to build that door to to stop the cats. I have to Mike Roberg the hell out of that door. <laughs> you have to what? Mike Roberg the the hell out of that door. Who? <laughs> Mike Roberg. Isn't he the guy that did the squirrel thing? Mike Roberg. Roberg, isn't that his name? What's his name? Mark. Mark. Robert. Mark Robert. Mike Robert and Mark Robert. Whatever. <laughs> How can you? Yeah, it's oh. Mark Robert. You don't know. No, it's not Mark. It's not Mark Robert. 
What? Red Rover, Red Rover, send Mark right over. Fine, come here if you want to talk to us. <laughs>